for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Once again, Heavenly Father, we seek your guidance by your word. We pray that we'll be able to see and know you more as we come into your presence. Let the book, the Bible, speak to us so that you may be revealed to us some more. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, amen. Let us refresh ourselves from what we talked about in the past three weeks. We read the same text as we did earlier, but we concentrated on one of Jesus' royal titles, which is Mighty God. We also learned that Jesus is indeed God, and I even gave you extra biblical records proving so. And we have confirmed that Jesus, the Word of God, is nothing less in nature than God, Elohim. Moving forward, we're looking at another one of his royal titles, Prince of Peace. Who among us has ever dreamed of being a royalty? Growing up as the third child of uh, six siblings, there was always an, this imaginative kingdom that I rule with my subjects. My sword would be from smoothed out uh, bamboo sticks. My younger brother will always be my knight. And our enemies were either the tall grasses or the banana trees in our backyard. I also had a cape that is oversized towel that I would tie around my neck. Then I had this other stick that I used as a horse and I ran around our backyard imagine, imagining that it was a majestic white stallion. Those kinds of inspirations might have stimulated the great minds of the famous composers and musicians like that of Handel's Messiah. Listen and watch this video clip as a flash mob in a court in a food court singing hallelujah chorus. It doesn't matter the place where you sing it, it still gives you the same impact, glorious and magnificent.
get the lyrics? Song goes, For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. A kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. King of kings, forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And the Lord of lords, forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That song is so majestic, regal, and royal. A song with full description, fit only for a true king. King of kings and the Lord of lords. But you see, that king of kings, the maker and ruler of everything that there is, there was, everything that will be, Jesus, the word of God, who is nothing less in nature than God, came down and became like one of us, human. And what did it take for him to do that? What did it cost the king of all creation to be human? It wasn't very simple. It's not simple at all. Read with me how Luke wrote the accounts in the second chapter and verses 1 through 21. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinus, the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his town, his own town, and Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of, and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with a child. And while they were there, a time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for him in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that happened, that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things pondered them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, seen as it has been told them. And then of eight days, he was circumcised. He was called Jesus, the name given by the angel, before he was conceived in the womb. And the Lord bless the reading of the scriptures. Skeptics, cynics, and all those who wanted to say that Jesus was just a legend will say about verses 1 through 7, that this was just a coincidence. But no, this was a well-planned, well-played orchestration of events, just like the way Handel played music with his oratorio. The declaration of a census, census taking to be exactly during the time that Mary was about to give birth, Joseph and Mary being in direct lineage of King David, so that they had to go to Bethlehem, and Mary being a virgin and giving birth to a son, all of these were exactly as it was written in Isaiah 5 and in Mike, Isaiah 7, I should say, and Micah 5. In the middle of this year, in July 22nd, Prince George Alexander Lewis was born to Prince William and Kate. This baby 
is the third in line to the throne of Queen Elizabeth, and you wouldn't imagine the extent of media coverage this prince had even before he was born. All the announcements, all the news networks, each one of them focused on this prince that will be the heir to the throne, but only third in line next to Prince William, his father, who is next to Prince Charles, who is next to the queen. I find it very interesting, though, that when Jesus was born, God chose an obscure village with probably not more than a thousand people living in it. He picked a scared young teenage girl whose womb will nourish and grow the one who is the savior of the entire human race, including this teenage girl herself, Mary. He allowed himself to be vulnerable, weak, dependent on the protection and provisions of the betrothed husband, Joseph who was a simple peasant himself, a carpenter, or probably even a stonemason. At the risk of their lives, they allowed themselves to be used by God for his sovereign plans of salvation. Oh yes, there was a big announcement too. The entire host of heaven announced Jesus' birth. But to whom? These lowly shepherds. The shepherds are not important people. Just an opposite. Just the opposite. Second shift smocks who work outdoors. Back in the day, watching sheep was not exactly a rock star kind of gig. Yet they were the first guests in, invited in the celebration. They saw the skies ripped open and heard a song in heaven. In just one winter night, these social misfits witnessed more of God's glory than all the priests in Jerusalem. There's another announcement made, not by angels this time, but by these two old people, Anna and Simeon. If you keep on reading to the end of the chapter, chapter 2, you will see them. Alone and elderly, these two people almost completely invisible in Jerusalem. Invisible to everyone except the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God has been whispering to them in, for decades that they would witness the most important event in human history. Even after they held the baby Jesus that day in the temple, the world would have considered them people at the margins of society. Let's yet, Simeon and Anna were on God's secret plan decades before the rest of the world knew what was going on. These humble beginnings in Jesus' birth did not stop there. He had a humble life. There was nothing extravagant in it. He was not even a toddler when Joseph and Mary had to take him to be a refugee in Egypt. Then they went back to another obscure village, Nazareth, where he grew up. So obscure was it that from the time he was 12 to the time he started his ministry, there was no record of him growing up. Presidents of nations such as the United States of America get elected to office, but before they start their actual service, all of them will have to undergo a ceremonial event, making the start of their four-year term as the head of the state. In this picture, Roosevelt's inauguration. Of course, these inaugurations cannot proceed without these great and extravagant celebrations. Marching bands, fireworks, and merry festivities all across the nation. With eyes of the entire world watching through all the media outlets. You know the deal. When President Barack Obama was first sworn in office in 2008, I was in a course training then and our trainer, the instructor, stopped what we were doing. He switched our projector screen so that all of us can witness the big event that was happening. With Jesus' inaugural celebration, it was simple. There was a man named John. Some people think he was a lunatic. He was a hobo. He lived in the desert, long hair probably with dreads. He was dressed in camel's hair. His diet was purely with what he picked in the desert, honey and cactus plants and whatever he found there, locusts, grasshoppers. He was the messenger, the announcer, of Jesus' start of ministry. And then all throughout this three-year ministry, there was nothing fancy with him. When Jesus approached him so John can baptize Jesus, John announced, Look, 
Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And further, John said, I saw the Spirit descend upon he from heaven like a dove and remain on him. I myself did not know him, but who sent me, but he who sent me, baptized with water, said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descending and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. That's in John 1, 32 34. All throughout this ministry, this humble Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one whom the prophets say, on whose shoulders the government shall rest upon, whose royal titles are Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, did not have any luxury in him. In one of his preachings, when a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This is the same Jesus who stripped himself of all his glory and was humble and obedient enough so that he was able to say, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And by saying that, he meant to the point of being obedient enough, even to the point of death. His death was long been appointed by God, as prophesied by Isaiah in his book in chapter 53, 3 to 6. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid hide their faces, he was despised and he, we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He humbled himself to the point of the cross. In spite of the shame that comes with it, he was up there, hanging on the cross, half naked and bloodied from the beatings that he endured from the mock trial. He took upon him the curse that would have been for us, as it was written, curse is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles and that's us so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith it's Galatians 3 13 and 14 Jesus Christ did this so that the divide between God and man will be removed Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to save me and you. He took the curse to himself so that the fellowship between God and man will be restored back to the original, just as it was in the time of Adam and Eve when they had full access to the presence of God. You see, however pure and honest man's purpose to restore peace between themselves, between groups of peoples, between nations, can never achieve it. He can never achieve it. This is because the peace between God and man has been broken so that the purest intent of world leaders to create world peace can never attain it. Here is an excerpt of a speech of Prince Charles at an Advent reception in the Middle East Christians for the Middle East Christians and was published in December 17, 2013. And I quote, For 20 years I have tried to build bridges between Islam and Christianity and to dispel ignorance and misunderstanding. The point though, surely is that we have now reached a crisis where the bridges are rapidly being deliberately destroyed by those with vested interest in doing so and this is achieved through intimidation 
false accusation, and organized persecution, including to Christian communities in the Middle East at the present time. Let us remember that we are talking about Arab Christians, Syrian, Iraqi, Palestinian, Egyptian, and Saudi Christians, as well as those from the Arab countries and from Iran, not Western Christians living in the Middle East. It is impossible for man to achieve real peace in this world because the prince of darkness, the author of lies and confusion, Satan, is the one who is ruling this world. Peace can never be achieved by us, mere man, because we are not the prince of peace. This humble child, Jesus the Christ, is the prince that brings peace between God and man. He was a type that was prophesied in the Old Testament as the righteous and acceptable peace offering to God. He was based on the perfect requirement of the Mosaic Law in Leviticus written hundreds of years before he came. He was without blemish, without sin, clean before the Lord. He was the one Apostle Paul referred to when he wrote in Ephesians 2 and verses 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down his flesh in the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace. Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. The only one who is able, the only one who is qualified to do so, and the only one who is obedient and willing to do so. If you continue through verses 17 and 18, it says there, And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. The reason for the Advent, the reason why we celebrate this season, the true reason of Christmas is all about Jesus and his great work of grace so that we can approach the throne of God. Jesus has torn down the wall that separates God from man. It was through him we, are, we now have access to the one spirit of the Father. So now, with the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross, we can go in and have, for, have the former fellowship that man originally had with God in the garden. Allow me to invite any one of you who heard this message to surrender your life to Christ to allow him to give you peace the peace that surpasses all our understanding the peace that only Jesus Christ can offer if you accept Jesus you will be given the right to be called a child of God a member of his great household I will close this message with the last verse I'm going to give you it's in verse 19 of Ephesians 2 so then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God and that can only be attained my brothers and sisters if you surrender your life to him Amen